Welcome everyone to Tuesday night meeting. Thanks for being here. So I wanted to let you know that if you have any questions or anything regarding uh, the meetings or prayer ministry or anything of that sort, you're welcome to go to the website and or call the number on the screen. Uh, also, if you look over to the bottom left corner, you'll see something that looks very familiar. That is our church directory. And I'd like for you guys to pick it up and open it up. And I'd like for you to give a call to uh, someone maybe you know, maybe someone you don't know, so that you can check in on our church family and friends and, and find out how everyone is doing or just touch base uh, during this time that we have to uh, be outside the church building. Uh, so thank you so much for that. We also have a live online church gathering. Uh, it'll be at 4 p.m. Uh, this Sunday. Uh, you can connect by an email that will be sent around 345 so that you could connect to that. We would love to have you connect with that meeting and join us. We will also have a prayer ministry meeting uh, this Sunday after church. It'll be around 1130. Um, if you'd like anything else, uh, questions or anything, you can contact Catherine Pacelli, and her number is on the screen as well. Uh, so, yeah, please uh, give us your prayer request, and we'd love to hear some praise reports as well. Also, Gateway Church, we have tithing where and uh, offerings that you can do online. And if you're not comfortable doing it online, uh, feel free to mail it to the address on the screen. Uh, we would uh, appreciate that very much. This Thursday at 6 p.m. online, uh, we have our group life group meetings. Uh, you can get a hold of um, Mike Dillman, and his number is also on the screen. Uh, please connect with one of these groups. We have at least two or three going right now and working on some more. This is a way for us to connect right now because we're not able to be in the church building uh, to ch check in, have fun, laugh, uh, pray for each other, you know, praise each other, encourage each other, whatever it is. It's just a way to connect and keep us connected until uh, things calm down and we can get back into the church. And welcome again to this Tuesday's meeting, and thank you all for coming. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Give me just a second as I get all my stuff set up. All right. There we go. Yeah, well, thanks again for sharing your time with us. Um, you know, I feel like we're getting uh, getting closer, even though we're doing it online. This is awesome. Thank you so much. And so uh, we're going to jump into the Bible study. And so I'm going to do just a quick review before we get into the Word. Uh, so last week, we actually looked at uh, Acts chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. And just kind of a quick review. We're not going to dig deep because we did that last week. We're going to just look at a little bit and then jump right into this week. Uh, last week, we actually saw Paul standing before the Jewish council. And as he was standing there, he had a big aha moment. He was looking intensely at the council, and he just realized all at once that there, the council was divided up between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Um, I think that was a God aha moment. You know, like whenever God lays something on our heart, and we're like, wow, I just didn't notice that. Because, see, Paul should have noticed that because he was familiar with the council. And so he saw that, and he had that moment. And um, whenever he looked, he said, wow, okay, the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in an angel. They don't believe in a spirit. Um, they don't believe in any of that. But the Pharisees believe in all of it. So he had a way to more or less take the attention off of himself and cause them to disagree with each other. And uh, hopefully uh, things will work out better for Paul. So that was his plan. So actually what he does is in the middle of the meeting, he shouts, he says, my fellow Jews, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Um, that's why I'm on trial today, because of my hope that the dead will rise to life again. And boy, that was, uh, that was like throwing a bomb in the meeting, because as soon as he said that, I mean, immediately 
everybody stopped looking at him and the Pharisees and the, and, and the Sadducees looked at each other because the Sadducees don't agree with any of that. And all of a sudden, uh, Paul had a whole room full of allies because all the Pharisees were agreeing with Paul. It's amazing. Well, I mean, that was a God-ordained aha moment, a God move. Um, so a huge argument breaks out in the, in the council room. And so it actually culminates whenever the scribes, which were, they were the lawyers of the day. They were Pharisees, but they were also like the, the lawyers. They were the ones who really spent much of their life researching the customs and the law of Moses and really interpreting what it meant for, for the people. So it culminated at that moment where the, the, the scribes stood up and said, uh, we don't find anything wrong with this man. Um, maybe it could be a spirit or an angel spoke to him. And in doing that, I mean, it was already an argument between them and the Sadducees, but it was like taking a stick and just reaching across the room and poking the Sadducees again because they didn't believe in any of that. So they sided with Paul. Paul has allies. The Sadducees are uh, more angry than they were to start with. Um, and so things get escalated, and they uh, more or less Paul's about to be killed in the midst of that. So the Roman commander rushes in the room uh, and saves Paul again. Uh, you know, he was, him and his troops were getting pretty used to saving Paul. But they ran in and saved Paul's life again. And it's really neat because, of course, they take Paul back into the fortress, which we talked about over the last couple of weeks. It was, this, it was where the Roman garrison was stationed right next to the temple area. So they took Paul back into the, the fortress. And that night the Lord uh, appears to Paul and encourages him and tells him, he says, Paul, even as you've spoken at Jerusalem, you'll speak for me also at Rome. So uh, just what a great wrap-up to a really messy situation. So that's our review from last week to this week, so everybody should be up to speed. Um, if you're not, everything's recorded, so you can go back and watch last week's, and you don't have to get the review, you can get the real thing. All right, so we're going to pick up this week. Uh, this is Acts chapter 23. We're going to look at verses 12 through 35. All right, so here we go. Now, verse 12 and 13, uh, it says, The next day... So this was the next day after that meeting where the council turns on each other and the Roman commander rescues Paul and takes him back into the fortress. So this is the next day after that. It says, More than 40 Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath to have no food or water until they had killed Paul. All right, so you've got this group of Jews. Uh, they're not happy with the way things worked out. Um, they wanted Paul dead at that point, or at least they want him to be judged, but this Roman commander comes in and rescues him from their retribution and their wrath so they're not happy so they make a plan to kill Paul um, and see and as you see I understand I underlined bound themselves under an oath because see that's a big deal what it is is they actually bound themselves with an oath uh, which is a curse they actually placed the curse on themselves if it didn't work out they said God if this doesn't work out I ask you to do whatever to me so they actually, it was an oath, but it was actually to bound themselves under a curse. They neither eat nor drink. Um, but you think about this. That was actually a very motivational curse because, um, you know, they, they vowed not to eat or drink. And that's really interesting because, you know, you could, you could take an oath of a lot of things, but if you vow not to eat and drink, you're going to hurry up and try to fulfill whatever you said you were going to do because you don't want to starve to death and you don't want to go too long without eating. So that's what they did is they, they made an oath. Uh, that they would hurry up, basically a motivational oath, they'd hurry up and do it because, of course, they didn't want to go hungry very long, I'm sure. Um, but see, there's actually something significant. Is apparently in that time frame or that era, um, people who made vows or made oaths, um, they could actually, if things didn't work out for them, they could actually go to the rabbi or to, the, to the, uh, somebody on the council, one of the priests, and say, look, I tried, it didn't work release me from it and the Jewish council members you know the rabbis they could actually uh, release you from something they could absolve you from that commitment if you weren't able to fulfill it but you know um, that's actually not the biblical way uh, that things happen I mean you can try that but the thing is is no no when you make a vow or an oath it is it is significant it actually impacts your life it has a lasting effect on you and so we're going to talk a little bit about some scriptures that talk about oaths and vows, you know, to see that it's not quite so easy to get out of it as just having a rabbi saying, okay, you couldn't do it, I absolve you, now move on and forget about it. So here we go. We're going to look at Numbers, chapter 30, verse 1 and 2, and it says, Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, 
This is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow uh, to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word but must do everything he said. See, that's about a vow and an oath. I mean, you, you have to, put this way, according to the Scripture, you're supposed to fulfill it, do your very best no matter what to fulfill it. You couldn't just try a little bit and then, well, it didn't work out, I'm done, and then get absolved by a priest. All right, let's look again. Here's Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 through 37. Uh, the Bible says, and of course this is Jesus teaching, he says, again, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. You see, Jesus says don't take vows, don't to don't sit here and, and just kind of put oaths on things because that's a different thing. That's not just, that's not a good thing. All right, so let's look at one more. This in James chapter 5, verse 12. James says, but above all, my fellow believers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. That's any kind of oath or vow. But let your yes be a truthful yes and your no be a truthful no so that you may not fall under judgment. See, it's a big deal. I mean, you know, it's a big deal to take a vow or to make an oath. Um, so I want to share just a little story, a testimony from my own life um, about the power of a vow, the power of an oath. Um, you know, um, years ago, I, was, I actually used to work out of town, and I was gone quite a bit. And so, uh, actually, I was gone for a period of probably about six months, and whenever I got home, um, my first son, uh, our, first, our first boy, Actually, him and I hadn't seen each other for six months, and so uh, he 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 was on, he only lived a short period of time after our return from that working trip, and then he passed away. Our first son died at a young age, and whenever that happened, um, it just so impacted my life. It it was uh, you know I, I I kind of I felt guilty for not being there uh, for more of his life. You know I didn't know what was going to happen. Nobody does, but uh, but I just didn't know. So um, actually, out of that place. I made a vow, and uh, it seemed like a great idea at the time. I vowed to never leave my family again, and so I stopped working out of town. I was home with my family. Um, you know, it seemed like a great vow. I mean, that seems like an honorable vow, doesn't it? You know, hey, I'm going to be there with my family. I'm not going to leave them again for any reason. It seems like a great thing. And, you know, that was actually, uh, it was working out okay when our children were young, <laughs> when they were little and young, and they were all home. Um but, you know, when they became adults and started moving away, uh, that vow became a problem because, you know, I said I'd never leave my family, but guess what? That didn't take into account the fact that they would leave me. You know, what do you do with that? <laughs> you know, how do you work with that? Um, but it was really interesting because, you know, as our kids were young, uh, God had called us to move to several different places. I mean, he clearly laid on mine and Cheryl's heart that he was leading us to this place or that state or that town or whatever. And so he moved us around into brand new areas and brand new communities several times. And it wasn't that big of a problem, you know, when our kids were young because, you know, that we were all together moving as a family. But then whenever our kids started moving out as adults, it got a little more uncomfortable. But just to kind of take it a step further, um, I remember that uh, <laughs> the Lord actually called us to move again. And this was um, actually just for me and Cheryl. Our kids were adults. They had moved out, but some of them were still living in the community. So we were still close as a family, but then God said, I want you to go over here. And all of our kids were adults, and he just, me and Cheryl were the only ones moving. And I remember um, we were riding down the car as I was contemplating that move because it was just going to be me and Cheryl, and our family wasn't going with us. And I remember having a severe panic attack. Um, it was terrible. I was overwhelmed. We had to pull the car over because I was overwhelmed, and I, w I really got sick. Um, and I didn't know. I was like, what is going on? This is this isn't the kind of person. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not like that. Um, but as we pulled over the car and we stopped the car, I remember the Lord speaking to me, and he said, he said, remember that vow. And it, it shook me when he said that. Um, because, see, what had happened, that honorable, noble vow that I made when my kids were young, 
um, I made because of our first son dying, and it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, but what it had done is that vow, it actually, it had fenced me in, and it had minimized my Christ-given freedom. And that's what vows do is they'll, they'll fence you into something, and they'll, they'll literally minimize the, the, the fullness of what God has for you. A vow will do that. You have to be careful with that. Um, and also, I made that vow out of a place of hurt. I just lost my son, and so what I, I was making, I was responding out of hurt to make some, a vow or a commitment that I thought would be good for our family. And actually, um, it wasn't. But I want to say to you, please, whenever you're in a place of hurt or disappointment or even when you're really excited about something, be careful what you, what you vow to or the oaths you make. Be careful of the commitments that you make. Um, actually, another um, kind of a, I don't know what you call it, like a flag or something to keep an eye on, is be careful of always and never statements. When I will always be like this or I'll always do that or I'll never be like them or that or I'll never do that. Always and never statements can actually, um, it can cause you to commit to something that you will not be able to honor, and that becomes an oath. So be careful of always and never commitments, and please be careful to what you commit to when you're in a place of pain or suffering or hurt, or whenever you're super excited because everything worked out and you're always going to do this. So be careful of those because those things God takes seriously. And like, uh, like the Bible says, you're supposed to honor those commitments uh, because they're, they're a big deal to God. Okay, so let's keep moving. And once again, in closing on the commitment to oath thing, just like the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's enough. That's enough. All right, so let's keep going with the study. Okay, here we are in verse 14. It says, and, and, and before I read this now, remember, we've got this group of over 40 Jews who bound themselves to an oath to kill Paul. So here you go. So that group, they went to the high priest and the elders to divulge their plans and said to them, We have united in a solemn oath not to eat or drink until Paul's dead. All right? Um, before we go into 15, I want to make a statement with this. Is, um, when it says they went to the high priest and the elders, um, I really believe that, that they went to the high priest who was Ananias, who was a Sadducee, who was totally against Paul. And I believe they went to the other members of the council that were Sadducees. I really don't believe they included the Pharisees in this because, remember, the Pharisees had just sided with Paul the day before. So I believe this was a, and I'm speculating, okay, but I think there's some evidence here. I believe this was a, a Sadducee and uh, assassin-only meeting, <laughs> okay? So they got together because they were all on the same page. None of them liked Paul. They all wanted dead. So I think that's what that was, a Sadducee-only meeting with the Pharisees left out, all right? And so they went, they share the plan, and so we look at, is in, uh, in verse 15, it says, So we urge you to have the commander bring him to you as though you were to determine his case with a more thorough inquiry, and we will kill him before he even gets here. So what they say, here's our plan. Um, Ananias, send word to the commander to bring Paul back in here so you can uh, ask more questions and inquire of him. And what, what it was is the assassins, they knew where Paul was in the fortress. They also knew where he was going to come in before the council. And somewhere between the fortress and the council, I'm sure they had a spot picked out to ambush him and kill him. So that was the plan because they couldn't get into the fortress. There was no way to get into that Roman garrison and kill him. But they knew they could get him in route. And so that was their plan to kill him in route before he ever made it to the council chamber or wherever he was going to stand before the council. Um, and uh, so in verse 16, when Paul's nephew, his sister's son, overheard their plot to kill him, he came to the headquarters and informed them of their plans. So let's stop for a second in verse 16. Paul's nephew, his sister's son, overheard the plot. How did he overhear the plot? I mean, where did he come from? Paul's nephew all of a sudden is in there he overhearing a private council meeting. How did that happen? You know, um, we don't have a lot of, uh, of historical evidence here. However, I'm going to share what, uh, what, is, what, is, what is said here because there's, there's more said here than you actually read. For this young man to be in that, in that council setting, you know, he, he either was A, he was uh, much like Paul. You know, whenever Paul, before he became Paul, he was Saul. He was being mentored by Gamaliel and he was being trained under that council member, Gamaliel. So the thing is, is, there's a good chance his nephew was being mentored or trained by a council member. 
It's very possible. Uh, the next thing is he was at the very least a young man serving the council in some capacity because you don't just you know you just don't walk by private council meetings and you know you just didn't do it. So there's a good chance he was either being mentored by a council member or he was possibly serving in some capacity in the council area or uh, with the council. Um, very cool, very cool. So then as soon as he hears, we're back in verse 16, as soon as he hears the plot, he comes to the headquarters, which is the garrison, uh, which is the fortress of Antonius where Paul was being held, and he forms their plans. So Paul could have visitors. You know, Paul's a Roman citizen, and he was not convicted yet, so he could have visitors. So his nephew comes in and shares the news with him. Um, and then in verse 17, um, Paul calls for one of the captains and said, take this boy to the commander, for he has something important to report to him. All right, so he comes in, shares the news with Paul, and then Paul says, uh, sir, please take him to the commander so he can share it with him. So the captain took him to the commander and informed him, Paul the prisoner asked me to bring this boy to you because he has something important for you to know. Okay. So I want you to just look at the, look at the providence of God here. God positioned Paul's nephew in a spot to hear of that plot before anything ever happened. You know, God is always, our God is always several steps ahead of the devil. He's several steps ahead of the devil in Paul's life and he's several steps ahead of the devil in your life. Don't Please don't think the devil's ever ever one up in God. He is not, and he never will. Okay? So let's keep reading. In verse 19, the commander took him by the arm. So he took the young man by the arm, led him aside in a private room, and asked him, or in a private place, what do you have to tell me? He replied, the Jews have plotted to kill Paul. Tomorrow they will ask you to bring him again to the Supreme Council under the pretense of wanting to question him further. So he shares that with the, with the commander. All right, so let's keep going. In verse 21, don't believe them because they have 40 men lying in wait to ambush Paul. These men have sworn an oath not to eat or drink until they've killed him. They're all waiting for you to agree to their request so they can carry out their plot. Uh, you know, I just kind of want to do a quick, just kind of a quick touch, just like lightly touch these last few verses, and then we're going to look at something. God positioned Paul's nephew in the right place for the right time to get the information needed to save Paul's life because Paul was being sent on to Rome. Remember, God said, I'm, you, as you spoke to me in Jerusalem, you're going to speak to me in Rome. Paul's journey wasn't over, and so he had, he had this young man in the right spot at the right time. All right, so I want to kind of talk about some things rec regarding this, this concept. Okay? Before God created anything, he finished everything. I've said this in the services, but I want to say it again here. Because you're watching online, maybe some of you haven't seen uh, seen this thought yet. This is a saying I've had for years because, you know, our God, um, before he started doing anything, before he created the first, the first thing ever created, the first whatever in creation, before he did that, he finished everything. See, our God is eternal. See, God, our God, he went to the end and, and, and crafted and created the perfect ending the way he wanted it. Then he backed up before he started and said, this is what I have to do here, 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 and here to get to that finished, beautiful, final product. And so that's why we know everything, hey, church, we, we've already won because of Jesus, you know, and God's with you. So let's keep going. I want to touch some more things. In Revelation twenty two thirteen, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the eternal one. See, God is eternal. That's how he was able to go to the end and, and finish before he started. We don't understand that because we live in the confines of time, but he doesn't. All right, so let's look at a couple other things. Here we go. God has never reacted to anything. He's always proactive. The devil is always reactive. That's why God's always a step ahead. Amen. And one last thought for you here. God made provision for the problem before the problem ever happened. Do you know that? He's got provision in place before you ever reach that spot of needing it. So wherever you're at today, if you've got something you need, realize that there's provision there for it, and it was in place before you ever had the problem. All right, so connect with Jesus and receive what you need. <laughs> you get with Jesus. you got time right now. I mean, we all have a little extra time around the house, so get with Jesus and receive what you need. Amen. So praise God.
So let's keep going. In verse 22, it says, The commander dismissed Paul's nephew after directing him, Tell no one that you reported these things to me. Okay? In verse 23 and 24, Then he summoned two of his captains and said to them, I want you to take Paul by horse pack to Caesarea tonight at 9 o'clock. Dispatch 200 infantrymen, 70 horsemen, and another 200 spearmen to provide security and deliver him safely to Governor Felix. So as soon as he gets the report, he dismisses the young man. He calls two of his captains and says, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do this. And at 9 o'clock, you, you're going to depart for Caesarea, which was actually on the Mediterranean Sea. So you're going to Caesarea. And actually, that was uh, where Governor Felix, the, the governor of that area, was actually, whenever they were in that area, they, they stayed in Caesarea, and that's where they governed from. Okay? So let's keep going. So what we've got, we've got, before we read the letter, we've got 472 Roman soldiers assigned to protect Paul to get him away from the Jews who wanted to kill him. And so they were supposed to make, him, make sure he made it safely to Caesarea, and that was actually about 60 to 62 miles away from Jerusalem. Um, and so when he's, he actually sends a letter to Governor, Governor Felix. So here we go. Here's the letter. It says, From Claudius Lysias to His Excellency, Excellency Governor Felix. Dear Governor, I rescued this man who was seized by the Jews as they were about to put him to death. I intervened with my troops because I understand, I understood that he was a Roman citizen. Actually, he didn't understand until after the first time he had rescued Paul. Remember, he rescued Paul from, from the Jews beating him, and at that point he didn't know he was a Roman citizen until he spread Paul out and was about to scourge him. Then Paul says, whoa, I'm a Roman. That's when he found out. So the first time he rescued him, he didn't know, but after every other time after that, he knew. All right. It says in verse 28, it says, I was determined to learn exactly what the charge that they were accused him of, um, so I brought him to stand before the Jewish Supreme Council. I discovered that he was being accused with reference to violating controversial issues about their law, but I found no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. So when I was informed of an imminent plot to kill him, I sent him to you at once and have ordered his accusers to also come before you and state their charges against him. Sincerely, Claudius Lysias. So that's the letter that he sent to Felix. Um, and so now Paul is no longer in Jerusalem, okay? Uh, the, the, the people who, the, the, the assassins, they no longer have access to him. And that was wisdom on that commander's part to get him out of that place and get him into a safer place to stand trial. Also, Felix, uh, he understood the, Jew the Jewish customs much better, so it was a better spot for actually him, you know, Paul, the Roman citizen, to stand before the Roman governor who had some knowledge and experience of the Jewish customs and the Jewish law. Okay? Um, so here we go. We're just about to close out says the soldiers carried out their orders and escorted Paul during the night until they reached the city of Antipatris. Uh, the next day, the horsemen continued on with Paul, and the rest of the soldiers were dismissed to return to the headquarters. Okay, so actually, uh, Antipatris was a, that was a little over halfway from Jerusalem. So you had J Jerusalem, and then they were going to Caesarea about 62 miles. This was roughly a little over the halfway point probably about 32 miles, somewhere, a little over 30 miles. So that was the halfway point. Um, and so the next day, the horsemen continued with Paul, and all the rest of the soldiers returned back to Jerusalem. Okay. And then at, at verse 33, it says, Upon their arrival in Caesarea, they presented the letter to, go, to the governor and brought Paul before him. After reading the letter, he asked Paul what province he was from. Paul answered, Southwest Turkey. And see, that was a big deal because, uh, you know, uh, governors oversaw specific areas, and he wanted to make sure that Paul was uh, was a Roman citizen of the region where he governed. So, and Paul was. Um, and actually, uh, Paul was. It says from southwest Turkey, uh, excuse me, southeast Turkey. But actually, Paul. Uh, some translations say Saul of Tarsus, which actually was part of Cilicia. So, and in closing tonight, the governor said, "I will give you a full hearing when your accusers arrive here." Then he ordered Paul to be kept under guard in Herod's palace. What a journey. <laughs> what a journey. My gosh, look at what Paul went through. 
You know, but in closing, I know we looked at a lot of scripture tonight, but in closing, I just want you to, to once again just reflect on the fact that every step of the way, God protected Paul. Yeah, he went through some hardship and some difficulty, but his God was always there. Your God is always there too. You know, the same God that protected Paul, the same God that watched out for him, the same God that was always a step ahead of the enemy's plans is the same God that's always protecting you and watching out for you and a step ahead of the enemy's plans in your life. So please, please, please rest in him in this season. Rest in your God. Rest in his provision. And know he always, always has your best interest at mind and in heart. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, you're so good. Oh, Jesus, we give you praise. Oh, God, thank you that even tonight in the study, God, I was reminded again, Lord, that you are, Lord, you are our provider. You're Jehovah Jireh, our provider. But you're not just our now provider. You are our provider who provided before we ever had the need. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for that. And, Lord, I pray you bless everyone watching tonight, God. Lord, help them to just to sense your presence. God, to connect with you quickly as they pray and as they read the word. God, that they would just have meaningful connections with others, Lord, even as they, they, they make phone calls or text or email, whatever they do, God, whatever we any of us do to connect, God, make it good. Lord, make it good. And God, we love you, Lord. Thank you so much for your precious word in Jesus' name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you next time.